Hello and welcome to PySchool of AI session 14, Pitch Day. So today we will learn about the business challenges and the groundbreaking technical solutions our AI fellows have been, fellows have been working on for the past eight weeks. So um, I want to thank everyone joining here and those connecting online for joining us and celebrating their successes. Uh, I'm Cristiano, I'm the lead AI scientist at PySchool, and I'm going also to uh, present a little bit the rest of the team. The basic mechanism that Pi School, um, how Pi School works, um, you see, on one side we have uh, companies or startups that have uh, some uh, business pain, and on the other side, there are many brilliant uh, scientists, engineers that uh, are already trained a little bit in uh, machine learning, deep learning, AI, maybe software engineering, and um, what we are doing is basically helping company and startup solving their business pain, building small teams of uh, brilliant engineers that we are able to select worldwide. And uh, they will be supervised by our machine learning scientists and machine learning engineer. We call them coaches during the school of AI. And uh, after eight weeks of uh, fast hands-on prototyping, we are able to come up for a solution, uh, a prototype solution for, for, our, for the sponsoring company or startups, and in addition, new experts in machine learning and AI, because during this eight weeks program, these uh, already trained engineers will grow and learn new stuff. In particular, they are learning how to apply machine learning, deep learning, AI, technology on real-world business uh, problem. And um, the School of AI program is uh, eight week long. It's really hands-on. It's not about lecture. Again, we are working on a real-world uh, problem sponsored by company or startups. And uh, we are very good in proceeding during this eight week thanks uh, to uh, an agile and startup mindset. Okay, so we start from week one with, uh, I don't know, a baseline model, and then we improve, we receive the feedback from uh, the sponsor, and we try to improve week by, by week. Uh, for the fellows, for the brilliant engineers, the program is free. They receive grants from, uh, from the sponsor, and everything is supervised by our coaches that are senior machine learning scientists. So, I hope this is clear. I, I would like to give you some number. Again, Seb mentioned that we reached 100 uh, challenges uh, exactly this session. This is session 14. Uh, so uh, 100 prototypes delivered since the beginning 2017. Uh, we have more than 200 fellows now. Uh, I think 220, 230 and um, that were selected among many, many engineers and scientists worldwide. There are some of the uh, companies and startups, you see, there are uh, big companies, startups, institutions like the European Space Agency, and so really a huge of different uh, uh, businesses, you see. And this is the team. Uh, in particular, some of uh, us are here. Uh, Seb is in Cannes. Uh, Isa will join us soon. Uh, Marco is uh, traveling uh, around the world. He's doing a competition, Translated 9. Uh, it's, it's the name of the boat. Basically, it's, uh, I think, now in uh, close to South America, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so, cannot join us. He's <laughs> uh, sailing. Um, and again, Maite, you will see her in a while, and you, you just saw her at the very beginning. Lucia is there, <laughs> helping us with, 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 um, with the, the communication, and uh, our machine learning scientist, Marcello, Vij, and so it's somewhere here is a project manager of the European project. We are very strong in winning European projects, and so we need a very good project manager. <laughs> And uh, Andrea and Ionelia, we will meet, you will meet us uh, later, later on. So, I think uh, we, are, we are done. 
I'm done and we can start with, uh, with the pitches. Basically, you will see uh, three pitches. Uh, the first two are, uh, uh, let's say for confidential reason, we are not mentioning the name of the sponsor. Uh, this happens when the sponsor requires some, uh, let's say, confidence um, or privacy. And so we can start with the first one. I will leave the floor to Andrea and see you later. Okay, thank you, Cristiano, and good evening, everyone. First of all, let me give you some context on the challenge my team and I worked on during the last eight weeks. So instruction manuals or step-by-step -step guides are something useful and necessary in uh, a variety of tasks from the most basic ones to more complex ones. And this applies even more in a business scenario. Why is that? Because uh, in business scenarios, you can have established processes and protocols that are also complex. And uh, you may also have uh, rotating stuff and a very constant turnover. So um, you usually have to um, new employees that uh, have to learn uh, the, the same job uh, very often. And so instruction manuals in these cases can guarantee consistency, efficiency, and agility, so they speed up the process and um, essentially um, help you in the process. So why am I telling you about this? Because our sponsor creates uh, these, let's call it, interactive manuals that are uh, an easy way for professionals to learn and execute processes that are uh, repeated several times within uh, a company. But how do they do so? They start from recording an interview with a domain expert. So they want to create a manual on a certain topic, they interview the expert, and they record this interview to later on be able to in extract the information from the, from the interview. They extract all the information that they need to create then the interactive instruction manual. Where is the, the bottleneck, let's say, here in this process? It's in the manual information extraction because on average, for example, it takes uh, at least three hours for an engineer to go over the recording and uh, extract all the information required. So it's a time-consuming process, it's a repetitive process, and it requires expertise and a lot of manual human effort. So this translates into a loss of revenue and also in human resources because, again, you have to employ at least one person to do this job. So the question is, how can we optimize the process? We start from the recording, so the uh, interview of the domain expert, and we have to end up in the, with the interactive manual. In between, we have our solution, which is an AI-based information extraction pipeline, which comprises uh, a transcription of the interview. So we, we have, as an input, essentially a conversational uh, data. And we use this data with a large language model, an AI model, that uh, can digest this data, this information, and extract in an automated way the process information and the steps that we have to perform for this process. And our output is a structured output, a JSON file to be precise, that uh, can be mapped easily into an interactive manual to, with an API call. So let me now leave the stage to Lorenzo, one of my teammates, that is going to give you an example of the process and go more in detail with the steps that we worked on. Thank you, Andrea, and hi, everybody. So we are interested in the building uh, uh, these uh, instruction manuals uh, using uh, large language models. This is a, a, a very complex problem, so we have decided to divide uh, it uh, into two different parts. The first part uh, is uh, to obtain uh, some general information uh, about the, uh, the process. And we can do that by simply prompting the, our large language model. So we are able to obtain uh, some information like uh, the title, uh, some description, and something about the, um, the authors. We are also interested uh, in uh, extracting the, the tasks needed to accomplish the, the whole process. And this problem is uh, really complex and uh, a large language model suffers of an issue called uh, hallucination. And to, 
which uh, practically means that uh, they tend to uh, make things up. And to address this issue, we divided um, this part into two different sections. The first one is to only generate task titles. So uh, we prompt our large language model and generate task title. So regarding the example uh, in, the, uh, in this slide, so making an Amazon purchase, uh, we obtain five different tasks. The first one is the open the Amazon website and login. The second one, search for the product and so on until the last one, which is the uh, submit the purchase. But we are also interested uh, in uh, um, have uh, a detailed description of uh, each task. To do so, we use uh, multiple calls to our large language model. And we iterate this process through each task title that we have uh, obtained in the previous step. And we also use uh, an extraction framework to help our large language model not to hallucinate. So we generate uh, a description uh, for the first task. Then we proceed with the second task and so on for uh, all of them. As you can see, for uh, each task, we have uh, three different fields. The, the first one is uh, the overview, which is uh, a high level description of the, of the task. Then we have some notes, and uh, at the end we have the steps, which are the uh, practical uh, and technical step on how to accomplish that task. So what we were able to obtain successfully is uh, to generate an instruction manual, which contains two different sections. The first one is the one containing uh, some general information about the process, and the second one is the one describing the, the tasks and all the steps needed to accomplish it. So, what are the impact of, uh, for our sponsor? Uh, principally two. The first one is uh, to that they significantly reduce the, uh, the generation time for their uh, instruction manuals. So before that, uh, they um, uh, usually take uh, more than three hours for each transcript, while uh, they now, it now takes only two or three minutes with our pipeline. And uh, they, all, uh, they also increase the, the quality of their uh, instruction manuals because uh, um, uh, of, uh, they obtain consistency because all of their uh, instruction manuals are now uh, generated by only one pipeline and not by you know, different persons working on different uh, manuals. And uh, also people have much more time to uh, focus on the, on the quality of, of them because they only have to check the output of, uh, of our pipeline. So this is the team I work with, and Andrea Ahmad worked in the first part of this pipeline, and uh, Raim and me worked uh, on the second one. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Lorenzo, for that wonderful presentation. So, uh, ciao a tutti, uh, <laughs> good evening. I, for one, never leave a chance to polish my Italian skills, especially in front of a crowd. I'm Vijayashree, as you saw earlier, Vij. Um, I am a machine learning scientist at Pi School, and I was coaching these challenges. Um, I'm here to tell you some interesting things about the challenge, because we as coaches at Pi School give you a bird eye view of the challenge so that you understand how we run you know, challenges here. Uh, two Two interesting things was that this team was spread all over the globe and uh, it's crazy but we somehow managed to interact pretty seamlessly throughout the entire process. The second was that you know LLMs are all the rage now. 
So this problem in particular was so complex, we had to split the team of four into separate teams of two. Now with having separate teams, you always wonder, how are they going to interact? Are they going to code separately? How is this all going to come together? But I'm so happy to say that all of, you know, all of the four team members, including the two who could not be here, were, um, you know, interacted so well, and we came together and delivered one solution as a team. So congratulations, all of you. And in conclusion, I would like to invite uh, Prakhar to deliver the next pitch. So. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So let's talk about the second challenge, which is revolutionizing retail with AI-enhanced stock management. Now, before I start talking about the challenge, I want to walk you through a story. So that's me let's assume, and um, I recently bought a new house, and I wanted to put all the best things in the house, the best curtains, the best sofas, the best everything. So on the internet, I found this vase. For me, I fell in love with this vase immediately, and I wanted to have it. So like everybody else in the room, I placed the order. Believe it or not, that's how long I waited, even for my order. So you know, it felt like forever, and after two weeks, they canceled my order, right? And uh, and obviously, I, I've, I'm sure most of you have faced this issue at, one, at some point in your life. Um, I went through a lot of emotions, but the first thing that I did, I went to another company and I placed an order for a different vase. And what was that? That was loss of business for them. But also, once I got my vase, I told my friends, if you order from this company, they might do the same to you. And that was loss of brand image. In the retail sector, these are the most crucial things. So I tried to put myself in the place of this business to understand what could they have done differently. Well, my first idea was maybe they could have bought a million products and never go out of stock. But obviously, they couldn't have done that, right? Uh, so that was out of the window. So what else could they have done? Well, they could have tried to estimate accurately how many products do they need to buy to satisfy customer demand. And that was the first half of our problem, demand forecasting. We leverage machine learning, deep learning, transformers to get to the accurate and the precise number of products that we need to order. But that's not enough. Once we know that we need to order a X number of amount, we also need to take into account multiple different factors, like the time for restocking, the uh, current inventory, the discounts, shipping costs, etc. And that was the second part of our problem. To answer the question, when should I buy these products? Now, this was done using inventory optimization. We optimized for the current stock, for shipping costs, for discounts, and multiple other constraints. Now, let's understand the scope of our problem. We were dealing with almost 309 different products. Now, um, a domain expert can look at a product and say, OK, maybe you need to buy uh, five products in the next week. But imagine doing that for 300 different products at scale simultaneously and accurately. We also had data for over two years, and we had to make weekly as well as daily forecasts. Now, we leverage, for the demand forecasting problem, we leverage three different types of models. We looked at statistical models, machine learning models, deep learning models, to try and approach this problem holistically. Now, I don't have to tell the people in this room, Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was our project. We started from week one till week six with an average error of almost 15. What does that mean? If we forecast 100 as the demand for the product, the actual value could be 115, maybe 85. But by the end of the, product, uh, end of the sprint, we were able to get down to almost two in error, which means if we tell you that you need to buy 100 products, the real demand would be 100 or two or 98. And in the last two weeks, we spent time fine-tuning our models for doing the integration testing and creating our APIs. <clears throat> let's look at an example for how this product works. So let's say our model tells you that you need to buy 310 products. That is already pretty accurate like we showed you. But could we improve this a little bit? If you bought 310 products, on the cost curve, you would be paying, let's say, 9,300 euros. This is an actual example that I'm talking about. You'd be paying 9,300 euros based on the average buy price. But this is not it, right? You have multiple different constraints. Maybe you get discounts for buying a lot of products at the same time. Maybe you have some costs associated with the shipping. 
Once we account for all of that, we can actually put this information in our optimization module and get a graph that looks something like this. What does this mean? By buying 20 more products, you actually save costs because there might be some discount programs. That is saving of almost 25% by making a simple data-driven change in your buying activity. And instead of buying 310, now you buy 330 products. So let's do a deep dive into how the whole pipeline works. We start by taking the historical sales data and run it through an algorithm selector, which is just a bunch of statistical rules to decide what model would work best for your products. It could be an LSTM, an ARIMA, a moving average, et cetera. These models then predict the demand over a period of time, which we call the forecasting horizon. Once that is done, we also take external constraints like current stock, shipping costs, manufacturing discounts, we bring it all together in the inventory optimization module and then tell you the final buy, buying decisions that you need to run. Now, why should you care, right? Well, this was our solution, but it can become your solution as well. The framework that we have created works holistically with any sort of problem. We take your data, run it through our framework, we take your constraints, put it in the inventory optimization, and we tell you how much you need to buy. This solution, it's generalizable for any industry, but it is customizable for your problems, and it is reliable because of the results that we just showed you. Now, the retail sector that we can possibly target, the $860 billion clothing industry, the $1,600 billion pharmaceutical industry, and the 200 billion food delivery industry. These are just some examples in the retail sector which could leverage technologies like these to drive more data-driven decisions and make better buying outcomes. Of course, with great work can only be done with a great team. Uh, Hari, the deep learning researcher, Valerio, artistical expert, myself as the machine learning engineer, and our mentor, Adrian, made this possible. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Prakar. So my name is Marcello Politi, and I'm one of the machine learning scientists of Pi School. And uh, for the last uh, eight weeks, I coached this uh, challenge. So I would like to spend, spend some words on the team. I think that uh, we were able to create this uh, great framework because uh, of the synergy inside the team. We, were, we had experts in uh, different uh, fields, so from statistics, software engineering and deep learning, and it is why we were able to face all uh, the issues or the challenges uh, of the project. I really think that the product we developed is valuable because I would say that, as Pagar uh, explained, is uh, domain agnostic. So you can just change the input and use the same pipeline for different uh, domains, different topics. But what I think has a great value and uh, that um, the team learned during uh, these eight weeks was how to translate complex uh, business requirements into technical ones. So um, working step by step on technicalities while translating you know, the requirements from the sponsor that some, uh, sometimes are really hard to understand. <laughs> then, uh, before calling Mabel for the next speech, I would like to invite our guest of honor, I would say, uh, Adrian Buzzato that you see here. So I will spend some words on Adrian that uh, maybe you can present yourself even better. So Adrian is an expert in uh, forecasting and uh, optimization under constraints. And uh, about his background, he is a physicist. Uh, he has done his PhD, if I'm not wrong, at the Fermilab in the US. He moved to the CERN in Ginevra where he has done his postdoc and he is one of the scientists that uh, contributed to the discovery of the Higgs boson. So I just would like to invite you on the stage and have a few words. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Adrian. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, mentor such a, such a great team on a, on a, on a, on a great uh, project. And this uh, topic of uh, demand forecasting and supplies um, optimization uh, afterwards. I think it's a topic that is, is old but has a lot of innovations to bring in from the latest research and it will be more and more used by uh, by companies to optimize. That's when you 
actually make the savings when you when you when you act on the optimizations. So I'll I'll uh, share a few words about my my experience here um, and what I felt that it is to be a, to be a mentor. So the key here is really to build impact and having data products and it is it is everything that we described today it's it's, it's products based on data and, and AI so it's not just a project that you do once it's products that you keep iterating and from that you keep making improvements based on the on, on the impact on the feedback so a few words about m myself as uh, as introduced uh, I was working on uh, the Higgs boson analysis for my PhD um, thesis, we, we got close to the Higgs boson, what it calls evidence for, or three standard deviations, one chance in 1,000 to be wrong. Uh, and this was uh, Peter Higgs uh, presenting, uh, I had a chance to talk to him to, to show the poster in, in, in April 2012, that was just a few months before the full, the full discovery. And that was one half of the story. Higgs boson giving mass to force particles, like W or Z bosons, for example. But there was a second half of matter particles, electrons that we are made of, and quarks. And that was my topic. And therefore, we continued the research for another seven years at, uh, at CERN uh, until uh, in 2018, we discovered this, 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 this second half. And that was a great uh, experience and, and honor for me to be a part of that. And after that, uh, um, long period of developing what we call in the industry data science skills because we're doing data analysis which involves statistics, optimizations, machine learning, uh, data pipelines. Then I made a transition to the to the industry and I've been working as a senior data scientist, currently staff, data scientist in, in Berlin in, uh, in, in the startup world. Uh, currently working at, at TM Mobility uh, that is a um, um, yeah, company that, that has scooters and electric bikes around. Um, we're also in, 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 in Rome for, for a while, I think not at the moment, uh, but this is uh, some of our e-scooters uh, uh, here. And here I work on optimizing again our decisions about the fleet operations in the field of data um, optimization with, with constraints. And I um, have some examples, and it's again the same story that we saw before. We need to forecast demand. And we also need to forecast the supply. Supply is not fixed, like, like uh, in your problem, we know what's in stock. You also have to uh, predict where our rentals would finish, that would be supply. So where would people go, beginning and end of their trip? So the ending of a trip, that would be supply, whereas people opening the phone to, to get um, an electric e-bike or a scooter would represent demand. And you can look at those in time uh, and space. Space is very important, like every corner of the street and weather and other factors, and you can maybe predict what will happen tomorrow. That will be the every hour, so that on total what will be tomorrow. And if you have enough predictions for the demand and good prediction for the supply, you have a difference, so you see where it's an imbalance, and it is there that we need to bring more vehicles. And also we want to swap the batteries and so on. So you have a lot of decisions which cost a lot of money, and therefore you need to write them, make the right one with the optimizations. And optimizations come with the constraints from the business. The business can be, we have some people in, the sh in, in a shift, there are some people with a van going around, and you have maybe five people with five vans, uh, that's 100 vehicles, but you need to move 1,000, so you need to pick the best 100 out of them. Or constraints from the cities, from the regulations. You can park here, not park there in the city center, you're not allowed to so, mu so much. So the result of business decisions, as mentioned earlier, communication to understand what has to be done, so that you really put into your problem. Once you defined this uh, mathematical operations, then you have these Python libraries that you can use, and then you can become better and better by using them, but, but really the hard and the correct thing is to convert the business to the, to the constraints and, and code them uh, correctly, mathematically. So while, while I had the opportunity to, to mentor these this, uh, great guys here working on, on this topic, um, we, we also thought what is the right, uh, what is the best way to, to mentor and to guide um, uh, teams as they, as they are growing. And we came up with a, with a, few, with a few, few aspects. And the, the, great, the, the theme is that on one side, as a, as a mentor, you're a bit more experienced, you know about the topic. But also you need to understand and be emp empathic and understand uh, the level and, and, and the challenges so that you can really put in your shoes. And, and here it helped that I was uh, teaching uh, physics and, uh, and, and programming in, in, in universities in my, in, in my research and also doing science outreach, communicating the, the to complex topics to the public. And therefore, um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it helps us to, 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 to make a team that is very, very effective um, and, and share, share this knowledge. 
So we want to anticipate what will be happening in the future. It's not just you do the product once, but you need to keep it the rate. And coming with some experience, you can anticipate future problems before you're at the beginning, and then you can help design design better. So as you start a project, you don't really know, but but a more experienced person can 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 tell you what could be potential traps in this topic. Then you need to to listen to, to, to your student to really understand what is the motivation, in which direction they want to progress their career. Then they could work on one aspect because it's multi cross-functional team. More is engineering, more is statistics, more is the optimization spot. And of course, you need to, 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 to make sure that you're available. Uh, when I was in, in Canada, professors uh, in the US as well had a, um, a schedule where, where it was alone in their calendar and people could go there and their door was physically open to, to, to invite you to go in. And, and, and this in encourages, so we try to be, to be active. And then you have to have the empathy to remember how it was in the beginning where we did not know. Um, and of course, have, have the experience uh, on these topics. After you do some work, then you also want to give some, some, some honest uh, feedback, which is constructive, uh, going with positives and say uh, things that, that should be improved, aligned with a goal. So it comes from the listening, right? If you give the feedback in a direction that is no interest, is not, not so interesting. Then you have to have patience, sometimes explain the same things again and again. And finally, you, you go back to, to the idea of data product and science to really trust the insights uh, this is where my, 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 uh, that's my understanding that you really need to, to really bring statistics, uncertainties, confidence interval to really make it uh, 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 predictable so that people can trust with some confidence. And then it's always good to go back to data quality, error propagation, and confidence intervals. And this is actually what we, what we get by having a background in, in, in sciences, especially in physics a lot. And from this together, you make a data product from beginning to end, from business to, to placing a solution. Um, and then if you go back and say, what should we do to really make an impact? We should really think of the KPIs. And the KPIs are of three types. And you start from the business KPIs, which are you want more revenue, you want to reduce cost, or in, and together you want to make the more profit margins. And this is why you have to communicate to your stakeholders, to the customers again and again to really understand that. And then you translate this problem into an operational KPI, which is, doesn't have money but has numbers like, I want more uh, more shift efficiency, I want more tasks done, I want more asset management, uh, I want more customer conversion, I want less customer rate, right? It doesn't money, but this is the things that, that people will be monitoring. And at the very end, you translate that into a data problem, and then you have the KPIs, classification, regression, they have their own KPIs. And as we progress in our experience, we go from focusing on this one into this one and in, 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 into this one. And it's all together that really, really make an, make an impact. And if we want to, to, to summarize an advice for, for people uh, beginning in, in industry in general, but especially data science, we really want to make a business impact. So to have a data-driven, actionable insight, you really need to, uh, to go with these KPIs from top to bottom. And then, in general, you know, as you work, you, you, have, a, you have a manager who, who, who kind of tells you what to work on, right? But as you get more experienced, you need to bring more confidence to be part of those conversations, to challenge that and say, do we really want to work on that? Do we really need to? So, and evaluate your own impact. And if you think it's not impactful enough, propose a new project or change if needed, but really you have to be your manager of your own career and really work on things that are very important to the business because you have to align for your CV as well and for your personal happiness that you worked on something big with impact. And again, how do you measure the impact? Uncertainties, right, uh, from statistics. And therefore, you need to use these uh, tools uh, from conformal prediction that has uncertainties on, on forecast. It's a new technique that is out there. Going to the basic standard error, error propagation and always is going back to, and I see that a lot, you know, we, we use machine learning, but machine learning makes a prediction, even if it does, if it shouldn't, because it's, you know, it always gives you a number, even if it, it's in a situation it has never seen before. And it's up to you to realize, has it seen it before? Which in statistics is, is it, does it have some neighbors, some, and that gives you a larger or smaller error. So it's up to us to decide what we trust and we, we don't trust. And with that, I, I thank you for the opportunity, yeah. Thank you very much, Adrian. So I hope you understand the quality of the team now. <laughs> so I would like to invite Mabel uh, to the stage for the next speech. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Hello everyone. Today I'll be discussing the reliability of medical literature. So our challenge was sponsored by Library Med, and Library Med is a health care, a health tech startup. And so let's jump into it. So in today's landscape, there's been an increasing production of scientific literature, it, which has increased over time. And this has accelerated exponentially. But, but even though these papers are being uh, um, published on a daily basis, a fraction of these papers are seen as untrustworthy. Why? Because they're not scientifically backed. And this is the question we'll try to talk about today. How can we improve this? Let's think about today's situation. In today's situation, there is an unprecedented amount of papers being published on a daily basis. For example, in the field of biomedicine alone, accounts for 50% of all scientific literature production. And on top of that, PubMed alone publishes 1 million papers annually. That's an average of two papers per minute. And so, as you can see, this can be a problem because doctors, healthcare professionals, researchers don't have the time to read these papers. They're busy, they read these catchy titles, these abstracts, but they have no time to actually check if these claims are true, if these claims are bold and actually reliable. And so we need to think of a way to solve this because the problem is this can lead to misinformation and this could lead to incorrect diagnosis. This could lead to misguided treatment and worst of all, harm to patients. And so this is where Library Med comes in. Library Med aims to efficiently analyze scientific and medical literature. They will provide trustworthy and reliable AI-driven insights. And they are targeted towards students, teachers, researchers, and medical professionals. And so let's jump into this. Our solution, we see a vision of the future where we give back time, and we save costs. By how? By implementing AI, specifically large language models. We have created a powerful tool that can evaluate the claims a paper can make. It can look at a paper and check the reliability of this paper. For example, take this paper for example. Our tool evaluates this paper based on certain criteria. For example, is the claim supported by a methodology? Then, our tool checks to what extent this paper is being if reliable or not. And this outputs a score. And so you're probably wondering, how does this look like on a technical point of view? Well, this is our pipeline. As you can see, the research paper is in the gray box. This research paper is then chunked down into subsections and sections. These sections are based on sentiment and also similarities. And essentially, this, these documents then go into the large language model. For example, it would go into OpenAI's GPT-4 or Mistral 7B. Once this data is passed into the large language model, it then goes into the classification, and that defines the criteria. And at the end, you get a reliability score and an in-depth reasoning. And so here is a demo we have created for you guys. You upload a paper, this paper then evaluated, a report is then uploaded, uh, shown, as shown, and then you get a title, author information, a score, and in-depth reasoning on if this paper is reliable or not. And so we created this tool, but how does this tool compare to a real medical expert? Well, we had a medical expert from Library Med evaluate 80 and 80 papers, and this was based off of five selective categories. And as we compared these two, we achieved evaluation time of two to three minutes. And we integrated GPT-4 Turbo and Mistral 7B. And so what was the accuracy? How did our tool compare to the expert? Well, we achieved an accuracy of 73% for GPT-4 and also Mistral 7B 65% accuracy. This means that 73% of the time, our tool was accurately able 
to actually check if this paper was reliable or not, and to check if these bold claims we made are correct to the extent of the criteria. And so we've talked about all of this. We spoke about time, we spoke about how this is relevant in, in, our, in the case now, but what does this look like in terms of costs, in terms of bi a business point of view? Well, on average, a doctor takes 20 minutes to scan through a paper, and that is equivalent to $35. And essentially, that is quite high. That is a lot of time and a lot of money. But how does this compare to our tool? Well, our tool, like I said before, only takes two to three minutes to evaluate. And the cost, well, it's only 18 cents. And so essentially, our tool can kind of um, rip away the time it takes to um, evaluate paper. And so over the past eight weeks, we have diligently evaluated and iterated our tool. So when we first created our baseline model, it cost around $1 to evaluate paper. And then over the past eight weeks, we got the cost down by 80%. And so in this whole challenge, we have leveraged AI. We, had find, we found a way to automatically evaluate papers based on the bold claims and check reliability. And as a result, we have reduced time and cost. And then we have, most importantly, increased trust and transparency again in the medical field. And so if we're thinking about this now, we've essentially made a tool that can bring that transparency and make AI and humans work together for a brighter and more reliable future. I would like to thank Kunta and Akrava for the diligent work, these amazing two engineers, over these past few weeks. We have built an amazing tool. So thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So I'm Yonelia, one of the ML scientists here at Pi School. I am pacing because I hate public speech. And uh, with, with Cristiano De Nobili, we coached uh, the, the team of Library Med. So as you understood, the project was quite challenging for various reasons. But the team did very well from the start till the beginning. They, they were able to research state-of-the-art LLMs. They picked um, ones from OpenAI and Mistral AI and, and um, did very well. Also, the challenging part was how to find the best metric to, to calculate this accuracy. This was very challenging and they did very well, as me will show you earlier. <clears throat> so with Library Med, we really stand on the brink of a new era of biomedical scientific literature. And now I will leave the stage to Maurizio Murino who is the founder of Library Med. Hello. <clears throat> um, you heard uh, Yonelia and Mabel. And very good presentation. It almost looks like there is nothing left for me to say actually, and, uh, and that's good. I'm happy about that because uh, clarity is a squishy beast. And uh, I think uh, that uh, Mabel and Yonelia proved that the team was able to catch it uh, by the tail. So that's good. I'm happy about that. I'm happy about that because uh, the path that uh, bring uh, Brian Gazier has been uh, quite hard, rhapsodic, with uh, steps uh, forwards and steps back. And uh, hopefully today, something that looks like uh, a step in the right direction, no? As you heard before, the, this volume of information is growing relentless, quality is swinging, and uh, a big chunk of this information is untouched. Nobody aside from the, the authors and the publisher even read it. The most estimated is, say, no less than 50%. So uh, what we are trying to do here, we try to build uh, the first of a tool set, a prototype, 
a scissor to scratch the surface of this uh, blob of uh, information, of unknown information. And that's hard because this blob is complex, uh, multifaceted, uh, with a lot of possible uh, angles of attack. So is the effort worth only a scratch on this, uh, on this monster, this information monster? And that's a good question. That's a very good question. And uh, when I thought about it, um, I found uh, an estimate produced by the World Health Organization estimating by the end of this decade, one billion people suffering from diabetes in the world. So imagine if with these uh, tools, with this project, we will be able to help doctors to find better information. So to help them uh, providing better treatment, even to only 1% of this billion. By doing so, we hopefully will be able, we could uh, create a better life for 10 million people, 10 million persons, their families and their communities. That's a good enough in my book to proceed with these uh, challenges, the efforts. Uh, and uh, if you do something good, something good uh, will come from it, hopefully. No? So, this scratch, hard to do, but uh, where could it end? How far we could go? How much uh, we can uh, dig in this uh, information mass? We want to find out, and uh, we'd like to not be alone in this, uh, in this endeavor, in this ambition. So in the next phase, uh, we will be looking for um, partners, uh, investors, uh, friends, people willing to join us and share their knowledge, uh, their enthusiasm, their ideas, uh, whatever. A lot of things that uh, I would never think about, of course. So I'm happy to be here because uh, a few of these things uh, we already found. We have already found them. We, we have here um, my partner in business, uh, in this crazy business, Elena. We had uh, the wonderful uh, guidance to Cristiano and Ionelia. You met, you met Mabel just before, Kuntal and uh, Akrapava. They were able to decompose, analyze, and formalize uh, a challenging uh, an ambitious, an ambitious project. That's why I say that may, this may be a step in the right direction, no? Just the beginning, maybe, sure, that's sure. But um, also in my book, uh, a good way to begin this point. So thank you a lot to the team, to Pi School, uh, for a work well done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Maurizio. Uh, oh, I'm uh, I'm happy to welcome to you, uh, Isabel. Maybe, I, yeah, I was waiting for for Era. I, I was just uh, want to comment a couple of things for 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 the for the pitches. So I hope you enjoy them. Basically, at Pi School, we really love to to work on uh, on challenges, impactful one like uh, like. Uh, for instance, Maurizio explain you uh, applied on healthcare. Uh, so I'm very happy to that was uh, all these challenges went uh, uh, very well. And uh, if you have uh, also any question later, you can find us, stop us, ask whatever. Because behind these uh, let's say seven minute pitches, there is a lot of work, a lot of coding, a lot of trials and error reading papers, forums, uh, uh, call with experts, uh, friends, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of things, it's, it's going on behind. So I hope you appreciate it. I will leave the floor to Isabel, which is the CEO of Pi School and co-founder of Translated and basically Pi Campus, the place we are now. So 
Hi, everyone. Sorry, I wasn't uh, at the introduction, but I just wanted to leave you with a few words. I hope you appreciated uh, the effort of all our fellows. I'm very proud of them, and I think it's it's super uh, good to leave them with uh, um, not only tech uh, uh, things, but with a mindset of uh, understanding what they can do uh, in their next companies to, uh, to uh, thrive uh, with AI. Um, I wanted to um, say thank you to them, thank you to uh, everyone, uh, to remind you of uh, the large language model uh, program that we've, uh, uh, we are preparing right now. It's going to be, uh, it's going to start in March 25th, if I don't, uh, okay. And so if you want to register for that, uh, we have two uh, levels, uh, one basic program and one for more advanced uh, engineers. Uh, to dig a little bit more on uh, large language models. Um, I want to celebrate tonight, leave you with uh, a good news. Um, we've uh, reached 100 projects. We've uh, helped more than 100 companies with uh, AI. Is the micro working? Yeah. So I think it's a really good achievement. I'm very, very proud. And we've done that with... Uh, cutting edge technology all the time, very uh, specific for, for these companies. Uh, and I hope you are, uh, there's someone in the crowd uh, that is next to work with us. Um, uh, we, uh, we're, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy. So we're gonna celebrate with a cake, uh, with 100, 100 projects and more than 200 uh, fellows uh, from the school came in from all over the world, lots of di diversity, lots of women too, and we are happy about that. So thank you very much for coming and thanks for following us.